I'd like to um, begin by inviting us to acknowledge the Lenape and Nanticoke peoples on whose ancestral land we stand. Um, we pray respects for their stewardship of the land uh, throughout the generations and honor their ancestral history as well as their futurity. And I'd like to also um, thank uh, Charlie Guerin for welcoming um, us here today to Ryan and Reggie for their generous invitation to speak. Um, I'm really honored to be here. And also to the staff of the Biggs Museum who've made us um, so comfortable here today. Um, and it's a special treat to um, see some familiar friendly faces in the crowd and to get to present alongside my mentor and friend Sylvia. So it's all around a great, um, a great day to be here. Thank you. Laid out on the mahogany dining table in a period room of the judges' lodgings in Lancaster, England, Lubaina Hamid's swallow hard marks a brilliant, disjunctive tone. Hamid, a black British artist, began her intervention in the Lancashire Museums by trawling for ceramics from local antique shops, church jumbles, and other secondhand venues. The mismatched assortment of dishes that she collected focused on British-made wares from the local pottery industries of the 18th and 19th centuries. Hamid then transformed these historic objects through her own additions of painted figures and images. And the theme of Hamid's painted intervention is Lancaster's long economic association with the transatlantic slave trade. The prosperous merchants of the country's northwestern region acquired success and capital through their financial investments in the networks of slavery that defined the culture and economy of the 18th century. Hamid depicts the material culture of the slave trade, uh, ship, uh, ship architecture and advertisements of sale, as well as the merchants themselves, responding with a visceral disgust and dismay to Britain's 1807 abolition of the slave trade. Other dishes, cycle back through, delineate colorful maps of the far-flung locales bound together by their investments, from the river port in Lancaster to the gold or west coast of Africa. Interspersed throughout, are quiet, intimate representations of black figures. Hovering on the periphery of a soup tureen's lid, wrapping around the body of a dish, or emerging from the basin of vessels, their faces are both weighty and contingent. Easily displaced, fragmented, or concealed, they also insist upon their own presence, engaging the viewer's attention through the naturalism of their representation compared to the more satiric caricatures of the other figures in the, in the series, and the steady power of their gaze. Hamid explains, quote, my work is trying to fill the gaps in a history which is there in front of us but is somehow obscured or perceived as clear and complete when it is not. I engage in a practice of overpainting which mirrors this process of gap filling in that it is an attempt to make more visible something that is already visible but which remains invisible. And I love the kind of contradictions in how she says this, that something is already visible, still visible, but also invisible. And there's a kind of um, illogic to those contradictions that I think is at the heart of her critique. Her account of history as something which is perceived on the surface as clear and complete could speak to how we narrate the past as a, series, a sequence of events and circumstances that are uncontested, inevitable, and conclusive. However, in light of her artistic practice, her remarks also reflect on a history not only of ideas and events, but also materials and objects. And of course, I think Hamid's intervention in historic material culture might horrify some connoisseurs because she actively paints over antique objects as a method of revealing. Swallow Hard's overpainted Lancashire ceramics and their location in a historic museum space extends also to a critique of the curatorial presentation of fine and decorative art collections on either side of the Atlantic. 
Displaying their objects in an orderly sequence of style, design, and craftsmanship, museums can treat collections as closed loops of aesthetic ideas that intellectually do not extend beyond the rooms that house them. History is presented as clear and complete, and the gaps in narrative as well as the connection between the contents of a collection and larger political and economic ne networks remain invisible and obscured. Hamid's explanation of her work as remaining, as aiming to make more visible something that is already visible, but which remains invisible, has recurred in my mind as I have reflected upon the colonial and early national collections of the Biggs Museum of Art. The contradiction at the heart of Hamid's words is the simultaneous visibility and invisibility of those gaps in modern history that touch upon the human lives and material economies of slavery. How can something be both already evident and visible, and yet persistently absent, as Ryan said, and invisible? How can we understand that dynamic to be at play in the local collections of the bigs? Each of us invited here today was asked to reflect upon the intellectual and material absences at work in the collection. As a scholar of the visual and material culture of the 18th century Atlantic world, my ruminations will center upon the collection's relationship to networks of slavery through the transit of its objects. Although divided by numerous distances of time, space, and seawater, the sphere of the Lancashire Museums where Hamid made her interventions and the Biggs Museum of Art in, uh, here in Dover, Delaware, are in fact closely intertwined. In the mid 18th century, both were prosperous mercantile communities whose local elite gained their fortunes through proximity to a river that mediated their participation with a greater Atlantic world. The Biggs collection of colonial and early national fine and decorative arts reflects this regional history as the makers and owners of these objects are notable for their close ties to the Delaware Valley. Furniture comes from workshops in Philadelphia and Delaware, while patronage traces to local individuals and families. Uh, the museum's contemporary interpretation of its founder's mission has resulted in an increased focus on this kind of local collecting. The result is a gem of a collection that reveals the specificities of culture within the Delaware Valley. For local visitors to move through a space that is linked thematically and materially to the region of the museum itself makes for impactful geographic and social ties between the past and the present. And I was really inspired by this aspect of the collection when I visited. Yet this showcase of local material culture opens out onto more global vistas. High chests were made from mahogany sourced from Brazil. The elite drank their tea out of porcelain imported from China. These objects were surrounded by a world of European goods, including silver, ceramic, and textiles from England, France, and the Netherlands. The ingredients Delawareans consumed out of these material objects, including tea, rum, and sugar, likewise were imported from around the world. All these items illustrate the burgeoning capitalist economy of the Atlantic that connected peoples, places, and commodities from around the globe. As Hamid so vividly illustrates in the Lancaster dinner service, the engine of this cultural and financial network was the trade and labor of enslaved people of African descent. Commodities traded around the Atlantic basin were underwritten by profits from the sale in enslaved people. Likewise, raw materials like mahogany lumber and plantation crops like sugar and tobacco were harvested and produced by the hands of enslaved people from indigenous America and Western Africa. Delaware was no different. A colony that had enslaved indigenous peoples since the settlement of the Swedes and had traded in African people since the arrival of the Dutch, the prosperity of its colonizers hinged upon their exploitation of slave labor for the production of plantation crops. Their trade in these and other goods up the Delaware River and across the Atlantic ensured their wealth. And here I show an uh, uh, image of the triangle trade. Can I go walking? Yes, I can. Um, that it, you know, shows this kind of lo localized mid-Atlantic region um, as, a, as a hub of that trade. 
A keystone to the big collection of colonial art are furniture and other decorative arts belonging to the Lockerman family. Over multiple generations, I'm going to say it a lot of times, so I'm making sure I say it right. It's Lockerman, right? Yes, okay, good. Um, the Lockerman men established their influence and fortune in Dover. The wealth of this Delaware dynasty was generated through a hybrid business model of plantation production and mercantile in industry perfected by uh, Vincent Lockerman Sr., um, shown here. Records reveal, and upstairs in the collection, records reveal that all of the Lockermans owned enslaved people, individuals whose categorization as possessions made them the most visible signifiers of the Lockermans' wealth. However, it was not only the local presence of enslaved Africans that made the Lockerman family complicit in the economy of slavery. Vincent Lockerman leveraged his wealth to connect to wider mercantile networks that were reliant on the profits of the slave trade for their liquidity. The violent economy of this period is present but invisible when we gaze upon the gleaming and beautiful surfaces of the Biggs Museum's objects. The gap between the two is the gap which Hamid's brush aims to fill. The actuality of slavery, a fact that not only stood alongside but funded the production, movement, and acquisition of these objects, clings to them even if we cannot see it. Why is it so difficult to locate this history in the polish of a mahogany chest or the milky sheen of a porcelain bowl? In his book, Slavery and the Culture of Taste, Princeton scholar Simon Gacondi argues that white participants in the 18th century's Atlantic world were pre preoccupied with cleansing the sphere of taste and culture from the vulgar realities of burgeoning capitalism, even as these economic networks funded the production of cultural artifacts like art, literature, and music. So in other words, though, the wealthy elite who are the patrons of culture are gaining uh, their capital through investment in economies of slavery at the same time as working to distance um, the reality of where the money comes from that which it uh, aims to support. Uh, Gikandi deftly weaves together the often bifurcated histories of, on the one hand, 18th century social life and aesthetic theory, and on the other, the mass transport and subjugation of enslaved people. He contends that while the boundaries between the debased moral choice of slavery and the elevated realms of fashion, literature, and sociability were carefully policed in the 18th century, they were actually mutually constructed and codependent. One relied on the other. Works of art, then, can contribute to the social reality of slavery and partake in its logic, even if they themselves do not overtly touch on the subject. Importantly, they do this through their own creation and movement along networks of global trade and exchange. And here I'm thinking about, you know, how Ryan talked about how today we'll be exploring macro and micro history. Some of those micro histories are about very local individuals and communities, whereas the macro are about how do they partake in this larger global system. And I'll be trying to think on the macro level through micro objects um, here in the the collection. So a few examples. Uh, that's not where I want to start. This is where I want to start. The most overtly political instance of this is visible in a stemmed wine glass and tumbler on a view on the landing upstairs. I encourage you to take a look at them. You might, you might miss them if you're not looking on purpose. Um, dating from the 1750s, a half dozen set of each were named on, an 18, on a 1780s probate inventory from the Vincent Lockerman House in Dover. Uh, and I know it, they are difficult to read, glass uh, is challenging to photograph, but on their surface, they depict ships at sail and declare success to the British fleet and health to George and Frederick of Prussia. Uh, these slogans connect the glasses to colonial American support for the Seven Years' War, um, often more popularly known as the French and Indian Wars here in the United States, a complex conflict with European and American dimensions in which the British and Prussian monarchies allied themselves against France and other European powers. 
Uh, and I know it's hard to get down in the weeds of a very old uh, battle, so we won't go too far. But in North America, the war resulted in British colonization of massive tracts of formerly French territory in present-day Canada, an increase in the empire that brought greater global power and continental influence, and also arguably uh, staged the circumstances for the American Revolution um, some decades later. As a British subject, Lockerman's ownership and use of the glasses marked his enthusiastic support for this effort and his own awareness of his personal material investments in a global imperial conflict. As a political statement, it reflects how elite colonial Americans celebrated their participation in an Atlantic system of political and economic interests through which their own wealth grew. Picturing ships at sea, the glasses actually visualized the maritime realm of battle that claimed and protected uh, trade routes for continued lucrative trade across the Atlantic, a trade that included and relied upon the purchase and exploitation of enslaved peoples. So we can imagine uh, beverages being drunk from these glasses in the Lockerman home, uh, causing uh, reflections within this local uh, venue of Dover on these more global um, connections that, uh, that support the family's sense of their identity and their familial wealth. Now let's go back. Uh, while, their lock while the Lockermans and their compatriots thought globally in this way and traded in this world of goods from overseas, they also bought locally, patronizing craft workshops in the Delaware Valley. This is most evident in the distinctive collections of furniture at the Biggs. Um, there, and there is uh, still much more um, to be learned uh, in, on this local level about the presence and role of enslaved people within furniture workshops of the region. Um, craftsmen, especially those at the top of their profession, could certainly afford to purchase enslaved people who might be trained in the trade or perform less skilled labor in the home or shop. Their names are inconsistently, if ever, recorded, meaning we often do not know if enslaved hands worked on a piece that ultimately only bears the name of the leading car carvers. Um, and this is true not only for furniture, but also for silver, um, among other uh, craft materials. And um, this was something Ryan and I talked about when I visited and I've been thinking about ever since, I think is an area that is ripe for um, additional um, research. Um, and the possibility is an apt reminder that throughout the colonies, and particularly in the North, slavery was an aspect of urban life, not only Southern plantation culture. Whether or not enslaved people worked on the furniture in the museum's collection, the relation between these objects and the network of the slave trade emerges in um, more concrete ways. And the first is in materials. As I said before, colonial consumers prized uh, the deep uh, red glow of mahogany, a wood sourced from Brazil and other colonial regions of South America that was harvested from forests by enslaved indigenous and African laborers who um, are uh, in regions of the Portuguese as well as Spanish empire primarily. Mahogany traveled the same networks as cash crops like tobacco and sugar and was entangled through production and trade with the institution of slavery. So if you take a look at, uh, again, at the tri triangle trade map, um, mahogany coming from South America is, is uh, along one of the arms with rum and sugar that is then funding, uh, kind of creating profits for the continued in investment in, um, in slavery. In elite colonial homes, finely carved wood furniture might be uh, some of the most valuable items in the possession of the estate. And that is the case with um, this uh, um, chest on chest in a, in a private collection, I believe, that is linked to the, to the Lockerman family in Delaware. Um, their value was equal to and calculated through the financial investment in enslaved people. So another way to think about these objects is how they created, they participated in um, a calculus of value that hinged on the assessment of uh, the financial value of enslaved people. Um, and in a culture that treated human beings as commodities to be bought and sold, material goods and people were intertwined 
not only in the spaces they shared, um, but the prices uh, they bought. And finally, this uh, flow um, between the production and valuation of material culture and the economy of slavery is perhaps most uh, palpably evident in my uh, third example from the collection. Um, this unprepossessing bowl tucked in a corner cabinet upstairs is of a British tin glazed ceramic type um, that was made throughout the 18th century in the coastal city of uh, Bristol in England. In Britain, Bristol was an economic hub of the slave trade, the home to merchants and sea captains whose careers were made moving people and goods around the Atlantic. Everywhere in the city, commercial enterprises and private wealth were founded on the profits of the slave economy, even as proportionately few enslaved people themselves might have been present in the urban landscape. This style, which is known as British Delftware, that term Delftware um, is uh, referring to its similarity to Dutch uh, forms of um, ceramics, uh, grew up out of this economic milieu. Um, and it's designed to present a cheaper alternative to Chinese export porcelain. Um, so the ceramics were conceived in the crucible of a trading town where every buyer is looking to pay the British equivalent of the bottom dollar. So um, uh, there is, uh, you know, this um, network of trade where where goods are coming from Asia, from other parts of the Atlantic world, in and out of the port in Bristol, um, at the same time that investors and sea captains, um, people who are actually on the ships trading and slave people are moving in and out of the city. And so this um, uh, art form of this uh, British Delfware um, um, it sprouts up because there is a market, but also as a solution um, to a desire to not have to pay top price for porcelain from China. Um, and you can see in its design um, that uh, it is uh, referencing both uh, European styles of ceramic ware as also kind of doing an English take on blue and white ware um, from, uh, from China. And um, uh, when I was uh reading about this, the example in the Biggs collection is actually linked um, to a painter, John Bowen, and there are other examples of his work, um, uh, work from the workshop he took part in uh, in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And you, so you can see some similarities um, in the design. You actually can't see it in um, the, the shot I have here, but there's another one of these um, jolly little ladies on the other side of the, of the bowl. But what I think is so interesting about them and what also um, uh, reminded me of Dover is uh, is the fact that you get the sense that Bowen is 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 depicting a generalized kind of fantasy scene that both touches on his view of uh, Bristol Harbor um, at the same time as kind of being part of uh, referencing kind of more generalized uh, chinoiserie scenes um, that are popular on um, on uh, on Chinese porcelain. So the Lockerman's trading interest, specifically Vincent uh, Sr., um, connected them to Bristol. Um, and uh, it strikes me that's a city that might have seemed to him both culturally familiar, even if it was distant, um, that the same uh, flow of trade, movement up and down a river, uh, connecting to other um, major uh, ports uh, by waterways um, is something that connected Bristol um, and Dover to each other. And indeed, that was the, the flow by which goods um, from Bristol would have uh, made their way um, to, um, to Dover. And uh, similarly, you know, in looking at these uh, bowls and the way I've described um, the, the scenes on them, there is, again, this sense of a both local and global style, a local form of ceramics that is um, flowing out of uh, global trade networks, that they would not be made without those um, networks. Um, and here I, uh, I show you just a, a little map of, um, of the city of Bristol in the 18th century. Um, a painted view of its of its um, harbor, 
and uh, and compare it in terms of waterways um, to uh, to um, the Delaware Bay and River and the location of um, of Dover uh, along along those lines. And interestingly, uh, what finally uh, did uh, this Bristol ceramic uh, um, industry in was the uh, rise of uh, Wedgwood ceramics further north in England, um, which uh, I think had a, just a much more stable business model as well as uh, um, more uh, refined and kind of responding to a more global taste um, style of ceramics. But it's interesting to make, I think, that comparison because of the fact that um, uh, Josiah Wedgwood, the, uh, as one of the, 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 the artists and business leaders of Wedgwood Ceramics, um, uh, chooses to ally himself with, uh, with the abolitionist movement through um, the famous uh, production of this um, medallion, um, which uh, is uh, speaking in support of the abolition of the slave trade by depicting in profile um, an enslaved African man with the uh, inscription, am I not a man uh, and a brother? Um, and I think there are many ways which I would be happy to talk for days about how there are, uh, uh, there is a kind of racist ideology in Wedgwood's own approach um, to the topic of abolition, that there is a, a, a white superiority that's embedded in his uh, way of presenting that issue. But nevertheless, uh, it's interesting that a, a ceramics industry that is really uh, part and parcel of the trade in um, in slaves in Bristol is supplanted by one um, that allies itself with this um, with this uh, political move movement. So moving beyond the material connections of the Lockermans to the networks of slavery, um, I'm also interested in how the museum, the Biggs Museum itself, might uh, um, you know embed some of these histories and values within its display. Um, and with their lineage as royal collections, museums themselves are linked to imperial practices of ordering and controlling the world um, through collection and display. Um, in his classic essay, The Exhibitionary Complex, scholar Tony Bennett argues that public museums were designed as environments in which the bodies and minds of subjects are shaped. The arrangement of objects within the halls of the museum and the prescribed methods by which visitors passed through these vistas of material wonder and intellectual no knowledge modeled and formed civic social identities. And uh, Sylvia discussed how we could apply this, understand this in the US context with the idea that early museums, particularly of American art, were conceived in her words as spaces of ancestor worship, but also as ways of uh, educating um, uh, new immigrants to the country in what it means to be American. And so we can think there about uh, you know the 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 question of who is included and who is excluded what dominant vision of identity are embedded in collections of american art in the united states and i think this is a question that we can also explore through the biggs collection um, founded in the local histories held in its galleries um, and this time i am thinking as i show here about the museum's holdings and paintings by the peel family um, that help us understand the political role of art and its display in um, the United States. So uh, Charles Wilson Peel, uh, the, the patriarch of the family who uh, painted um, these two portraits here that are on view upstairs in the collection, founded the first museum in the early United States. There's a good looking guy. Um, and uh, Peel is normally on view at PAFA. He's away, uh, he's away I think, right now. But um, you can see this, uh, this iconic painting normally in Philadelphia. So he founded the first museum uh, of, in the United States in an upper room of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, a conscious choice that mirrored um, the, the hall's role in the, in the uh, framing of the Constitution. He displayed his own painted portraits of American revolutionaries, always a self-promotional um, man, uh, taxidermied animals uh, from the territories of the Americas, as well as the skeleton of a mastodon that he himself had worked to excavate. And all of these things, it's a little dark in this 
you, unfortunately, but all of these things are evident um, in his in his um, self portrait here, uh, including. Um, the, uh, the, the, the portraits that are on this upper register, these cases hold taxidermy birds um, there. And then the mastodon is just peeking behind this uh, curtain that, um, uh, w that Peel magisterially uh, pulls back. And his painter's palette is also um, present in the, in, the, um, in the painting. For Peel, the museum um, art historians uh, have discussed how the museum was a mode of civic education for a new country. The object lessons, if you will, of his museum, artistic, historical, and scientific, were meant to teach Americans how to be citizens, um, to transform British subjects into American um, citizens. And as such, they uh, very self-consciously um, uh, narrate kind of who uh, questions of, of who belongs what constitutes American um, identity. And the ways that this is complicated from the, the outset, I think, are really um, uh, put in focus by scholarship around uh, the presence of an enslaved and then free black man, Moses Williams, within the very gallery of uh, Peel's museum. Um, a, uh, a young man um, who uh, was owned by the family eventually acquired his freedom, but was uh, instrumental in some of the entertainment um, displays um, in the museum, and yet is in many ways edited out of its history. So again, thinking about how some of these images of what citizenship in the United States mean are framed around uh, whiteness um, from this very early moment. So it prompts me to ask what, uh, um, what this museum um, teaches us about the American past and um, to think about how we might be able to complicate that through interventions. So the foundation of the collection was Mr. Biggs' interest in the style and craftsmanship of colonial furniture and decorative arts. Um, and to keep the legacy of Biggs' connoisseurial eye alive in the museum, um, the, the curatorial vision has maintained an organization and interpretive structure that prioritizes the sequence of styles over time, which you get a little bit of a sense in through these images. So terms like American Baroque, Rococo, federal and empire reference formal styles that highlight the relationship between American design and European precedents. While uh, not unuseful in the teaching of design history, the organizing influence of these terms um, serves to point audience attention to a formal comparison of styles rather than to a social life of these objects. It's not um, that it becomes more difficult to see their entangled relationship with period realities of slavery and colonialism, but rather it makes it easier to ignore those connections and place attention elsewhere. Uh, in Hamid's terms, a dominant focus on style serves to further obscure the already visible, um, which still remains invisible. And thinking about how, um, how uh, this can open onto other opportunities, um, again, reminds me of Ryan's uh, comment about thinking about expanding the museum beyond one voice, the singular vision of its founder, to um, reflect the community here in broader um, ways. So uh, to conclude, I'm going to offer a one uh, uh, or more, um, a one more and one less intensive suggestions for how the museum could center the complex histories of its Delaware collections and collectors within the space of the gallery. And I want to preface this first by saying uh, it never feels comfortable to critique people in their own house, so I'm a big fan. Um, but also that as someone who has spent time in museums, I know it's not as easy as it, it sounds just to kind of make, you know, put together slides, um, that there are financial resources, exhibition calendars, stakeholder interests, and audience expectations, among other concerns, that determine the pace and nature of change in the museum. However, I think even a day like today that makes space around objects um, offers us an opportunity to see our cultural and material histories in a new light. So um, idea number one um, is to introduce uh, new or different labels into um, galleries in the, in the museum. Um, at the Worcester Art Museum in Massachusetts, they've introduced uh, in the American Gallery supplemental labels that reveal the, um, the 
uh, sitters of portraits ownership of enslaved people. In states north of the Mason-Dixon line, this intervention can be especially valuable as it disrupts the myth that slavery only existed in the South and was not a local reality in more northern colonies. Um, at Worcester, um, John Wollaston, uh, the Younger's 1746 portrait of Philadelphia merchant Charles Billing, um, pictured here, uh, names enslaved people of his household whose names were drawn from archival documents. They include Negro Wench Clo, a Negro Girl Venus, a Negro Man John, and a Negro Boy Litchfield. And that it's hard to see, but that is what is um, on uh, this uh, label beneath um, beneath the, the uh, more traditional label of the museum. This interpretive addition has the effect of making the subject's participation in the institution of slavery implicit in the viewing of the portrait. It serves to entangle the process of looking at art with the moral realities of American history. At the Biggs, portraits of Lockerman family members could likewise be provided with labels that highlight their exploitation of enslaved labor and the growth of their wealth. Digging into historic realities as well as contemporary concerns, labels might also consider the dynamics of power and gender at play in Vincent Lockerman Sr. second marriage to a woman decades his younger. Um, in the era of hashtag Me Too and Black Lives Matter, the stories and experiences embedded in the lives of these founding individuals look and read quite differently and labels um, uh, could explore that. The Worcester Art Museum's labels uh, respond to Hamid's call to make more visible the already visible, yet invisible. However, as powerful as this strategy is, in some ways it is almost too on the nose, um, uh, in, I think, uh, reducing and localizing the networks of slavery in a way that still obscures the entire social and economic system. So only acknowledging direct ownership of enslaved people minimizes the extent to which all white people in colonial America and early national United States benefited from an economy founded on slavery. And this is palpably true in the Lockermans' case case as um, their wealth was accrued through participation in, it, in an Atlantic network of trade fueled by the economy. Um, the sugar, rum, textiles, and tea that were imported by Vince Lockerman Sr. Um, and sold were part of that infamous triangle trade. So interpretive labels for some of the objects I highlighted today could tease out these uh, less evident but still uh, powerful connections between places, materials, and things that built up the world of culture and taste that defined the Lockerman social sphere. Um, uh, so idea number two is temporary or permanent reinstallation of parts of the collection. Um, uh, so one possible way to bring these more complex uh, relationships into the museum space is a variation on um, a, uh, an experiment called Living Rooms, currently on view at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Um, with introductory labels that highlight the experimental nature of the installations, and again, I like that word experiment in these contexts, Mia has reinstalled and reinterpreted their period rooms to offer visitors unique perspectives on and sensory experiences of the past. So this one is not really to our, our point today, but um, it, it is super cool. Uh, the, the lights change and sounds change to kind of place you within an 18th century um, world. Um, but here, the Charleston drawing room has been reinstalled with historic and contemporary artworks by native peoples that highlight British colonial displacement of the Cherokee nation. And um, the home uh, from which uh, this room was uh, drawn um, was actually the home of an administrator in, uh, in colonial Indian affairs. Um, uh, so there was this kind of intrinsic connection between um, the decorative arts of the space and the and the work of the person who resided there that makes um, that makes this reinstallation particularly powerful. And the Providence Parlor brings to life the mercantile business of the space's original owners, whose trade in imported goods connected their local shop to the Atlantic world. This is Providence, Rhode Island. 
Um, and so uh, there's been reinstallations of objects you can touch and smell that highlights a world uh, of goods that are flowing in and out of Providence, another um, another uh, trading hub on the on the water um, that again reinterprets this room away from simply a focus on its architectural feature features to thinking about it as a lived environment. Um, in both instances, the intersections between global trade, the economy, and labor of slavery um, are made tangible um, in the gallery through diverse material cultures. So temporary experimental installations at the Biggs could explore the workshops of furniture makers, um, perhaps highlighting the local and global materials like pine and mahogany that they worked with, allowing visitors to explore through touch as well as sight. And supported by our archival research, these spaces could also consider the presence and participation of enslaved people within workshops and homes. In the absence of concrete material evidence, um, such connections are often difficult to make. Um, however, the suggestive space of an interpretive installation can allow for more creative forms of presentation. Uh, and this leads me to uh, my final uh, suggestion, which connects us back to Lubaina Humid from the beginning of the talk, which is uh, uh, commissioning an artist through residency or um, or uh, or uh, curatorial um, uh, participation to do an installation. Um, artists continue to be our most trenchant experimental historians. Lubaina Hamid describes the Lancaster dinner service as, quote, an intervention, a mapping, and an excavation. It is a fragile monument to an invisible engine working for nothing in an amazingly greedy machine. It remembers slave servants, sugary food, mahogany furniture, greedy families, tobacco and cotton fabrics, but then mixes them with British wildflowers, elegant architecture, and African patterns. And again, here I'm struck by how she uh, kind of points to the immateriality ultimately of the economy of the slave trade, this invisible engine, um, that is is uh, remembered through the fragile monuments of objects, um, but in its totality is often easy um, to lose sight of. And that um, her account of what her work seeks to remember includes, uh, you know, permanent things like ma mahogany furniture, but also impermanent things like uh, sugary food that was consumed and we don't have anymore. So this kind of impermanent and permanent um, mixed together through the intervention of the artist. For all we marvel at the persistence of objects, they do remain these fragile monuments, tangible markers of the transitory passage of sense and experience. Much as we wish they would, objects rarely give up everything about their pasts. It takes labor of many kinds, intellectual, curatorial, and artistic, to raise difficult histories to the surface. After all, as Simon Gakandi tells us, these objects were designed to separate violent economies from aesthetic pleasures. Filling in the gaps more often than not requires a creative touch, an artist's hand to conjure the magic and horror of the past. And I also evoke Fred Wilson, who's been mentioned a few times today, um, because in thinking about this, um, I was struck that when Wilson was creating his landmark artist curated exhibit, Mining the Museum at the Baltimore Historic Society, a key aspect of his preparation was talking to local stakeholders, um, community members, curators, museum staff, volunteers. Um, he's talked a lot about how he went and found indigenous communities in Baltimore that many people believed no longer uh, lived there. Um, and. Uh, and so I think the enduring legacy of Mining the Museum is a testimony to the fact that uh, the work had an impact on the community because it was made um, through partnership with the community. Um, and, uh, and thinking about today, thinking about the Biggs um, ambitions for the, next, uh, for the next 25 years, it really seems that it is about this question of reflecting um, the community, um, involving um, the community in more ways. Um, um, 
uh, which you know I think is 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 where where the answer lies because ultimately when we're telling stories um, about our past when we're seeking to understand our past through materials um, what we're really doing is asking ourselves questions about our future and our present um, and thinking about um, you know what compels us to return um, to these objects even after uh, the distance of um, centuries um, and so uh, so so I think that would be my final reflection is the way to expand these stories is to continue asking questions about, about who are we now, both in the museum and in the community. So thank you.